Hello everyone and welcome to today's learning session, Red and Biodiversity Conservation, organized by World Wildlife Fund's Forest and Climate Program. Thanks for taking the time to join us. My name is Green Burns and I'm a Program Officer for Learning and Communication. Our presenter today is Matea Osti, a Program Officer with the UNEP World Conservation Monitoring Center, and she's presenting today on behalf of the UN Red Program. So before we begin, I'd like to share a few housekeeping tips and reminders. Today's presentation is being recorded, and you can access the recording within a few days on our YouTube channel. To find the recording, simply go to youtube.com and search for WWF Forest and Climate, or go to panda.org slash forest climate and look for the red learning section. There are two audio options. You can listen via your computer speakers or dial in through the number that was provided in your registration email. It's important to note that if you experience audio difficulties while listening via your computer speakers, this can be caused by having multiple software applications open or multiple, multiple internet windows open. So please feel free to close some of those and that usually fixes the problem or you're always welcome to join via phone. If you're having any technical difficulties, please send me a message via the chat area if possible. Questions are absolutely welcome. Please submit your questions for Matea through the toolbar on your screen, and we'll answer as many questions as possible during the allotted time. For anything that we don't get to cover, you're invited to post them on our online Red Plus learning platform, which is called Red Community. And after the webinar, you'll receive a link to the place on the website where you can post your questions in the follow-up email. So thanks again for joining us. And with that, we'll get started. And I will turn it over to Matea. Uh, thanks very much, Breen. Uh, so good afternoon, everybody, or perhaps good morning. Uh, so I'd first like to say thank you to Breen and to WWF for the opportunity to present in this webinar session today. As mentioned, my name is Matea Osti and I'm a Program Officer in the Climate Change and Biodiversity Program at the UN Environment uh, Program World Conservation Monitoring Centre. I will be giving today's presentation on behalf of the UN RED Program and so will include a focus on UN RED work that addresses biodiversity conservation, uh, multiple benefits and safeguards. So for a quick overview of what we'll cover today, uh, first will be an introduction to Red Plus, or rather a recap since many of you are already familiar with the concept. Then we'll look at what are called the multiple benefits of Red Plus and the associated Red Plus safeguards. I'll then provide an overview of the UN Red Program's work in the area of multiple benefits and safeguards uh, before providing some examples of national work on Red Plus and multiple benefits, and in particular the role of spatial planning to inform national decisions on Red Plus, uh, multiple benefits and safeguards. Uh, next slide, please. So, to understand Red Plus, let us first consider the role that forests in developing countries play in the global carbon balance. Such forests cover more than 2 billion hectares of Earth's surface and include a wide range of ecosystems from dry forests to tropical rainforests. These forests are also high in biodiversity and provide society with valuable ecosystem services which support the livelihoods of more than 1 billion people worldwide. But, as we all know, in recent decades, these forests have also come under increasing pressure, mostly through activities associated with land use change, and in particular clearance of forest land for agricultural purposes. Uh, this has meant that forests in developing countries have become a considerable source of greenhouse gas emissions uh, at levels comparable to emissions from the transport sector. So, this is where Red Plus comes in. Uh, Red Plus was originally proposed by a group of developing countries wishing to tackle deforestation emissions whilst continuing to have resources to develop. A mechanism for Red Plus has since been discussed under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And the premise of Red Plus is this. By using financial or market incentives for developing countries, to maintain and carefully manage forest carbon stocks that are under threat from being lost or degraded, or by restoring lost forest, 
the international community can make an important contribution to global climate change mitigation. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, no, sorry. So over time, the scope of the mechanism has expanded from reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation, the bits in black there on the slide, to include other activities that may help to conserve, sustain or enhance carbon stocks of forest, so the bits in red on that slide. It's worth mentioning that the mechanism is still very much in the process of being negotiated under the convention and some uncertainties exist about its architecture and implementation, but many intergovernmental processes, both bilateral and multilateral, including through uh, the UN RED program, have already been established with a multitude of developing countries having started preparations for RED+. Plus. So what does support for RED Plus related actions look like at the global scale? Uh, to date, the development of RED Plus at the national scale has been undertaken mostly through bilateral or multilateral initiatives, uh, as just mentioned. And the map that's shown here is from the, the Voluntary RED Plus database, uh, which is an initiative of the RED Plus partnership. And here, national governments report to the database on how much finance they have committed for Red Plus related actions, and mostly, in fact, for Red Plus readiness. And to date, we have an ind indication from both funder countries and funding institutions, uh, including multilateral institutions, that around 4.5 billion US dollars has been committed between 2006 and 2013 for Red Plus uh, and two Red Plus countries. So this is not insignificant, but of course the amount of money flowing for Red Plus is expected to significantly increase once payments for verifiable emissions reductions come into play. Next slide, please. An important aspect of Red Plus is that it has the potential to deliver benefits that are additional to the primary aim of climate change mitigation through maintaining or enhancing carbon stocks. These are known as the multiple benefits of Red Plus and can include social and ecosystem based benefits. For example, for ecosystem based benefits, forest biodiversity conservation and maintenance of ecosystem services and livelihoods and social well-being on the social side of the benefits. Next slide, please. Of course, uh, these multiple benefits are not evenly distributed in space. Different forests have different values. And because different Red Plus interventions are likely to be implemented in different areas or regions. Next slide, please. Where Red Plus actions are implemented, will affect how multiple benefits are derived, including the extent to which there are opportunities for or risks to biodiversity conservation. So where and how you implement different Red Plus actions will also affect the potential risks to multiple benefits. For example, next slide please, if not properly done on steep slopes, whoops, can we go back? Site preparation for plantations to enhance forest carbon stocks can raise the risk of erosion. Thank you. So let's take an example. Uh, let's look at the Red Plus activity of reducing deforestation. There are risks to biodiversity from efforts to reduce deforestation if these efforts do not address the drivers of deforestation and displacement of land use change occurs in non-forest or low carbon ecosystems which may be important for biodiversity. However, if efforts to reduce deforestation also consider areas of importance for biodiversity, for example through spatial planning for biodiversity, this could potentially have a positive impact. So to sum it up, the benefits and risks really depend on A, the type of Red Plus activity that is being undertaken, B, the approach to its implementation, and C, the type and condition of the forests that are involved. Next slide, please. So in 2010, uh, parties to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change recognised the social and environmental benefits and risks of Red Plus, and in 2010 uh, agreed to promote and support a set of Cancun safeguards for Red Plus. Next slide. 
these safeguards, uh, among other things, state that Red Plus actions should be consistent with the national forest programs of countries, and as well as relevant international conventions and agreements, have transparent national forest governance structures, respect for the knowledge and rights of Indigenous peoples and members of local communities. Next slide, please. Ensure the full and effective participation of relevant stakeholders, and importantly, be consistent with the conservation of natural forests and biological diversity, ensuring that Red Plus does not result in conversion of nat natural forests, but that it is instead used to incentivize the protection and conservation of these forests and their ecosystem services to enhance social and environmental benefits as well. Also, that Red Plus addresses the risk of reversals and, displac and displacement of emissions, or otherwise known as leakage. Next slide, please. So, how does the work of the UN RED program fit in with countries' preparations for RED Plus, and in particular, in ways that help them to consider and enhance these multiple benefits? Uh, as mentioned, the UN RED program is one of two major multilateral initiatives that are helping countries to prepare for RED Plus. It is a collaborative initiative uh, on reducing deforestation and forest degradation in developing countries and is com pr comprised of three UN agencies, uh, UNDP, UNEP and FAO. It provides support in two main ways, uh, first through national level support to 48 partner countries which are visible on the next slide, uh, yep, you can see them there. Uh, a total of 17 countries uh, are receiving direct support to implementation of national programs for Red Plus and uh, other partner countries, uh, the ones in blue, may apply for targeted support to a system with smaller specific Red Plus readiness needs. The UN RED program also provides support through a global program of work on common approaches and analyses on issues such as MRV and monitoring, national government systems and importantly safeguards and multiple benefits. Next slide please. The UN RED work on safeguards aims to help countries address social and environmental issues in their national programs and other UN RED funded activities. The strongest focus is on supporting countries in developing country approaches to safeguards which are in line with the UNFCCC. Uh, it should be noted at this point that there is no fixed linear path towards the development of country approaches to safeguards. Uh, the steps taken will depend on what is already in place as well as the objectives defined by the country. And of course, throughout the process, uh, effective participation from relevant stakeholders is essential. So there are three main steps that a country may choose to undertake uh, when thinking about its approach to, to safeguards. The first one, uh, which isn't mentioned on this slide, is defining goals for the national approach. The second is developing any necessary policies, laws and regulations, PLRs, to apply these safeguards. And third is developing a safeguards information system. Next slide, please. Here is a uh, more comprehensive look at, at these steps. For instance, if we look at the PLR aspect, key steps include a GAF analysis of existing social and environmental PLRs and procedures and following on from this, the creation of new PLRs and procedures if necessary. Uh, the UN RED program is developing a tool to assist with PLR review against the Cancun safeguards, uh, building on its social and environmental principles and criteria. Now on the safeguard information system side of things, a uh, first step might be to identify existing systems that could provide relevant information, then to think about the indicators that can be realistically be included to demonstrate how the country is addressing the safeguards, and then to collect data on those indicators. Uh, these might include indicators on how the safeguards are respected uh, in the process of Red Plus implementation, or indicators of the impact of Red Plus activities on biodiversity, for example. Next slide, please. So, 
how might a country start thinking about its goals for red plus and safeguards to inform decisions on its strategy and thus its PLRs? Well, the use of maps to inform red plus planning uh, in the early stages of development has certainly gained traction in many countries, both those under the UN Red Program and, and those outside it. But why might we want to represent information spatially uh, in the context of red? Well, for one, maps are useful visual communication tools and they can usually be produced quite rapidly and cost effectively. Now, the work that is undertaken on mapping under the UN Red Program is primarily intended to support countries in moving towards land use planning for Red Plus that delivers multiple benefits. Uh, maps can help identify where given Red Plus interventions are feasible, uh, both in terms of existing designations, uh, likely costs and consistency with some of the safeguards, and on top of this, which areas might deliver most additional benefits. Next slide, please. In the context of multiple benefits, maps can help identify areas of high opportunity, so where carbon and biodiversity values are both high, as well as areas which may be at high risk. For example, areas which are low in carbon, uh, high in biodiversity, and have no protection. Next slide, please. Some examples of the types of spatially explicit questions that we can ask uh, during this process include where are areas that are important for biodiversity and how do they relate to areas that are high in carbon values? What pressures might these areas be exposed to? Where are these pressures particularly acute? Also, of the forest in country, where is forest being managed for protection and where is it being managed for production? Next slide, please. So at this point, I think it would be useful to take a look at some recent work that was undertaken uh, with, with the United Republic of Tanzania in this context. So Tanzania has just completed its first comprehensive national forest inventory, which provides an unusually good source of information for Red Plus for a developing country. The forest inventory can support the development of reference levels in MRV, and that was one of its primary aims, but it's also very useful for planning of multiple benefits and safeguards. This year, uh, the data from the forest inventory was combined with other data to create a large set of maps uh, that are of use for Red Plus spatial planning. These maps covered carbon stocks, biodiversity, ecosystem services, as well as the drivers of deforestation and forest degradation, uh, forest land management units, and potential zones for implementation of Red Plus actions. Next slide, please. So one example where spatial planning is important for implementation of the Red Plus safeguards is understanding the distribution of natural forests in a country. So the Cancun safeguards say that Red Plus actions need to be consistent with the conservation of natural forest and that, the, that Red Plus should not be used for the conversion of natural forest but instead be used to incentivize the protection and conservation of natural forests and their ecosystem services and other social and environmental benefits. So Therefore, it's necessary first to define what the nat natural forest is in a country. Uh, and of course, there are many different possible definitions of natural forest out there. Uh, the Tanzania National Red Plus Strategy defines natural forest as forest composed of indigenous trees not planted by man. But of course, it doesn't end here because this definition also requires a definition of forest. So, Tanzania has several possible definitions of forest. Uh, one, which was adopted by the Forest Inventory Project and also used in the FAO Forest Resources Assessment, but not shown on this slide, as far as I can tell, uh, defines forest as a minimum of 10% crown cover, 0.5 hectares of continuous forest, and a minimum of 5 metre tree height. Uh, however, there is another definition that has been submitted to the UNFCCC under the CDM, which also defines 10% crown cover but only 0.05 hectares of forest land and a minimum of 2 metre tree height. So, next slide please. 
we did a rough estimate of the implications of these different definitions to the extent of natural forest uh, using the recently developed National Land Use Land Cover Map for Tanzania. And you can see here the extent of natural forest varies greatly between the two definitions. Uh, and what you get with the second definition is you get the inclusion of additional land cover categories, essentially bushes, bushlands and thickets. And this amounts to a 38% increase of land that has been occupied as natural forest uh, according to that definition. Next slide, please. So building on this map, uh, we have another map where we've added carbon stocks to land with natural forest in green and land outside natural forest, uh, and that's shown in brown. Uh, and we've also indicated protected areas. And as we can see, by beginning to understand the status of forest in the country, base maps like these become very useful for informing planning for Red Plus uh, for a country. Next slide. Thanks. So the second case study that we have uh, is the, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And for the DRC, so the DRC's national joint program was validated in 2010 and it was supported by UNRED and the FCPF. And since then there has been a framework strategy which was validated in Doha, which also talks about multiple benefits. More recently, uh, there has been an investment plan for 2013 to 2016 and the UN RED program has been working with the government to build multiple benefits and spatial planning into this investment plan. Next slide please. Oh no, no. this is the right slide, thanks. So the, the, exa the example that's provided next, which is a map of uh, potential richness in fully protected species, is a good example of how you might go about determining what the priorities for biodiversity could be for a country where there is little information on what existing biodiversity priorities are. So for instance, uh, where in, in BSAP has not yet been developed or finalised and the fallback option in such cases and in this particular case uh, was to try to spatially represent a priority list of protected species that had been identified in the law for the DRC. So this is exactly what we did for the DRC from the map that you see here. We mapped the richness of protected species from the list of law and only three are shown here but I think there were at least 30 some species and then we used the IUCN species ranges uh, to map their distribution. So it's worth pointing out that in exercises like this you can't decide for a country what they mean by multiple benefits. You know, these need to be, there needs to be some process of communication with the country about what multiple benefits mean at the national level. This can be done either through consultation with the various decision makers or as, as in this case was done working with, with the decision makers through consultation as well and looking at the existing policies and laws to help inform uh, priorities. Next slide please. So the next map, and you can click through all of them Breen, thanks, shows the results of a simple analysis that was done looking at the importance of forest for reducing potential soil erosion impacts on hydroelectric dams. Uh, of course, there are more sophisticated tools for soil, soil erosion analysis out there, but we found that using simple analysis tools such as this one, which is essentially an overlay, is actually sometimes more effective and easily understandable for decision makers in country and really allows them to kind of comprehensively partake in, in the analysis. So for this analysis we used three parameters. We looked at slope, uh, annual precipitation and presence of dams and water catchments to look at uh, what soil erosion risk could be if you removed forest. So if we look in the northeast of the country, uh, you, you have high risk areas where you have high slopes, high precipitation and also lots of, of dam installations. Next slide please. Okay, so this <laughs> slide is in French but uh, it aims to show that you know, the wider context of soil erosion and the importance of soil erosion control services for national development priorities in this regard. It's, it's about taking issues like this 
from the small Red Plus team to the bigger national government level and, and showing how, you know, there, there are links, for instance, between forest cover and the hydropower strategy that, that a country might have. And as you can see, uh, this, this has been documented in, in the various photos that are shown there. So, to conclude, uh, there are kind of four main points that I'd like to make. Firstly, Red Plus has the potential to result in multiple benefits beyond carbon. In saying that, multiple benefits are not a guaranteed outcome. It really depends on how they are implemented and we also must not forget that there is a risk of negative impacts. Uh, the Cancun safeguards require, or rather encourage, uh, enhancing the benefits and protecting against risks associated with Red Plus. And finally, mapping can be an effective tool for countries' Red Plus planning and it can help identify areas of both high opportunity and high risk for biodiversity conservation as well as other benefits. Um, and hopefully we have shown that today with the examples of Tanzania and the DRC. Thank you. Thank you, Matea. That was a very informative presentation. So at this point, we will open up the floor for questions for Matea. And to submit questions, you uh, click on the question option on your uh, navigation pane. So Matea, to get us started, the first question we have is, how can local engagement be ensured in the process that you just discussed? Uh, well, I think that's a, that's a very important point. Uh, and it, local level engagement is very important in the context of, of multiple benefits and safeguards and of course uh, the wider uh, Red Plus implementation and planning. Uh, I can point to an example from Ecuador where the UN Red program has been working uh, with the country and in fact the multiple benefits and risks and benefits were identified as a result of local level meetings and workshops and then incorporated or are currently in the process of being integrated into their national level planning. So it was at this stage that they were considered uh, and, and are now going to have an impact on, on the national level planning. So yes, these, these processes are very local level engagement is key. Great, thank you. So our next question is from Makako and Makako asks, in the case of Tanzania, what kind of forest functions are mapped as ecosystem services? Forest functions. I right. I personally was not involved in in the analysis of that was undertaken for the Tanzania project, but I am happy to consult with my colleagues and get back to you. So the question was, what kind of what kind of forest functions are mapped as ecosystem services in quotations? Are mapped as ecosystem services. Okay, great. Thanks. So the next question is, how do multiple benefits and red plus fit in with national level policy? Uh, so the, well, it's worth pointing out that multiple benefits and, and considering these really form the, they should be considered in the wider land use planning context. Uh, and it's really important for different ministries uh, to communicate it with each other, both in terms of uh, Red Plus and its relevance for broader development policies that a country might have, but also so that we don't have policies which are going to conflict with each other. So, for instance, you know, permits that may have been developed under one policy for land use and mining and concessions um, versus the biodiversity priority considerations under another policy and so forth. So dialogue between ministries is key in this respect. Great, thank you. So the next question comes from Bruce, and Bruce asks, how is local expertise used and enhanced to build analytical capacity and voices in the decision-making process in the cases of Tanzania and DRC? Sorry, could you repeat that question again? How is local level? How is local expertise used and enhanced to build analytical capacity and voices in the decision-making processes in the cases of Tanzania and DRC? Okay, for Tanzania, I I know that the 
the data set that was used uh, on the Neforma data set that was developed was a national level forest uh, inventory data set that involved multiple stakeholders and I think also had some socio-economic surveys. Again, I wasn't personally involved in, in the analysis for this, so we'll, we'll, we'll happily uh, relay this question to my colleagues to, to provide comment on. Great. And, um, and as I mentioned, uh, everybody in the follow-up email link will receive a, um, a URL where they can post questions or we'll make sure that these answers are posted. It's on Red Community and it's a specific page for this webinar. So never fear. <laughs> so the next question is, why should other sectors or ministries be interested in multiple benefits of Red Plus? Okay, so I think that's it kind of comes back to the point I I made earlier, you know, it really has, Red Plus is, is a comprehensive land use. Uh, it has implications for, for comprehensive land use uh, policy and, you know, it is much as much a case of, of thinking about potential areas of conflict as well as coherence and, and, and for that reason also it's important for ministries, um, for different ministries to be in communication. Obviously, for instance, uh, one can think of Red Plus in the context of uh, well, both Red Plus and maybe other commitments that countries have, for instance, under the the, the CBD and the IG biodiversity targets, uh, and so it's it's good for ministries to be in touch so that they can look at synergies and potential complementarities uh, in that respect. Great, thank you. And so questions are still welcome, but I'm just going to walk us through a slide here while you're thinking and typing questions. So here, if you want some additional resources um, from WWF related to Red Plus, the uh, archive of this session and previous sessions, you can find them online at this web address. We also have a variety of resources that go out on a regular basis, either weekly or quarterly. So please feel free to sign up for those. And you can find more information about the five guiding principles for Red at that URL and of course our web address is uh, panda.org slash forest climate and you can always find us um, on Twitter and uh, that's our handle um, online again or you can always email us at forest climate so um, I think we may have come to the end of our questions um, Matea are there any other uh, final remarks you'd like to share or any other comments on this really interesting topic for our <laughs> attendees? I think, I think that's it for now. Thank you for everyone for, for joining in on the webinar session. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much to everyone. And, um, and if there are any questions that we didn't, oh, okay, actually we do have a question. Um, so this one, I knew that would happen. Um, uh, so this one is from Paul and Paul asks, what country is providing the most forward-thinking approaches to red and biodiversity? Uh, thanks very much for Paul's comment. Of course, I don't think it's it's not the case of, of any one country um, providing you know the best case study. Obviously, the questions that that are that are asked on biodiversity and conservation are, are different according to the country that you're. That, that is under consideration. Uh, the UN Red Program website does have a multiple benefits section where it does highlight work that it has undertaken with, with certain countries on, on, on these issues. Um, and so I would suggest going to that website to see you know, some of the flagship work that we have done with, with some countries. That sounds great and we can make sure we post that website, that web address on um, Red Community so people can find it easily. Sure. Let's see. And um, so here's another question from Makako. Um, and Makako says, ongoing discussions about safeguards in Japan shows a concern for costs. Does mapping, do mapping efforts require additional costs? Uh, thank you very much for that comment. Again, I think it really depends on what you're mapping and the extent to which you already have spatial data available. If, if there is good spatial data, for instance, on, on land cover and, and certain land use categories uh, and also biodiversity values, then, then the additional cost is, is not that high. Uh, but in places where some of this data may need to be 
extracted or compiled, obviously, that there may be higher cost implications. But what we have been finding with the countries that we've been working with is that uh, developing maps has not led to significant uh, additional costs. Great, thank you. So, and Nikoa has his hand raised. And Nikoa, I have unmuted you if you would like to ask a question. I'm not sure if you have a question, Nikoa. If so, the floor is yours. No, it's a comment. Oh, a comment, Hello, sure. Me. Thank you. Hi. Yes, it's a, it's a comment. I, I think that one of the things that we can highlight on your presentation, and by the way, thank you very much, um, is the something that we can see from the Tanzania experience that you presented and the uh, NAFORMA uh, National Forest Inventory effort that is being supported there, which uh, shows very well, and uh, you guys have some uh, nice uh, publication coming out of that, we how do, yes. collect, collecting data in the field that is usually uh, targeted towards um, forest and carbon data is actually useful and can be very, very practically used to collect data on safeguards, both social and biodiversity. Mm -hmm. And the point here is that the very first approach that could be taken for countries to address this issue is to try to, to um, kill, well, the analogy is not very conserva conservative, but uh, killed as many birds with a single shot. So if you're, once mm -hmm. you go to the field to collect data, collect as much information as you can. And the Tanzania uh, example that you showed uh, clearly is a very good example of that. That's right. It. Thank you very much. That's a very good comment. Well, great. Thanks. So. Um, if anyone has any final comments or questions, please feel free to post them. And if not, thank you, Matea. I will bring us to a close. And as I mentioned a few times here, don't worry. There will be a place to find follow-up information for the questions that we didn't uh, get to cover today. And for some of the links and resources that Matea mentions, they will all be on Red Community. And thank you for spending this past hour with us. Thank you to Matea. And with that, I will bring us to a close. Thank you, everyone, and we will see you next time. Thank you.